Hello, I'm Larry Woods. American farmers aren't the only food suppliers facing problems today. Fishermen, those rugged individuals who match patience and skill against weather and tides, are confronted with their own crisis. Because of a complex web of environmental and economic cross currents, the nation's fishing industry is not enjoying its finest hour. Starting this weekend, producer Andrew Dukach, along with Washington correspondent Bernard Shaw, will explain why fishermen are hauling in more contaminated fish than ever before, and what, if anything, is being done to reverse the situation. In successive weekends, we'll also explore how coastal development is encroaching on some of our favorite seafood, and how over-harvesting by some commercial fishermen is depleting certain species in massive numbers. There's a delicate ecological balance at work here, and there's much more at stake than we realize. From America's dawn, when the country was only a strip of colonies on the Atlantic, fishermen have tested their luck on the sea, searching for what seemed like an endless harvest. Today, fishermen say the industry is facing its most severe crisis. The problems are economic and environmental. The industry's losses can't be measured by red ink alone. The fate of the fishermen is entwined with the fate of America's estuaries and seas. I have never seen the fishing industry in 25 years, and I went fishing way back with my dad, and we come from three generations. I have never seen it as bad as it is at the present time. It's going to be an amazing thing to, to find out who is going to supply this seafood now. Commercial fishermen are being put out of business up and down the coast. People like to eat seafood. Who's going to supply it? Just as long as anybody can remember, I guess, people have been fishing on this bay. The Indians probably did it, I guess. And uh, if, if something doesn't change in the, with the pollution problems, it'll, it'll bring an end to it. Sooner or later, the bankruptcy has got to stop. But you've been seeing them going on in this country, and you hear the farmer's situation. These ain't jokes these guys are telling you. This is serious business, and it's the same with us. But suppose that fish just swam from out there 20 miles off the Gulf and just ate him up a big dinner that toxic way. Now, you, you know that by the time he gets here, and just because you put him in that hot grease, he's still got that stuff in him. Ethiopia is a good example of change that has occurred. The habitat has been drastically reduced to a desert form, and that's from mismanagement. The same thing can occur in the ocean. If we mismanage it and don't properly farm it, we're going to end up with a desert on our hands. This is Eagle Harbor a picturesque bay in Washington State's Puget Sound. But these beautiful surface waters veil a lingering disaster. The bottom is laced with creosote, a deadly toxic used to waterproof logs. EPA officials said that circumstantial evidence strongly suggests that the toxic chemicals came from this facility. And last September, the site was proposed for the agency's priority Superfund list. Government scientists are now studying the legacy of this pollution. Well, what we're doing is looking at relationships between toxic chemicals in the sediment and diseases in bottom-dwelling fish such as English sole. And what we found in this harbor is that 30% of the English sole approximately have liver tumors. And 90%, in other words, 9 out of 10 of these English soul have seriously abnormal livers. There's little question that these liver tumors are caused either directly or indirectly by uh, industrial-type pollutants. Looks like there's about 25% creosote in there. Really? It's extremely toxic, and it is that kind of an environment in which the bottom-dwelling organisms are obliged to live here. Somebody sailing in here with their yacht would say this is a very, very nice place. But if you, as I say, if you go down below and you look at the condition of the fish, and you, you realize that there's uh, something wrong with uh, what appears to be paradise. There are at least a dozen other toxic hotspots in Puget Sound, including the Duwamish River, a favorite among Seattle's recreational fishermen. People fish every day almost and right throughout the week for these and other types of fish. I always 
I think it's foolish to, to consume a, uh, a fish from a very polluted area which is known to contain toxic chemicals and which itself uh, is suffering from liver cancer. This is definitely a tumor within the liver, okay? It's a neoplasm within the liver and because of its pattern, gross, its gross pattern, we can fairly safely predict that it is a carcinoma. In other words, a cancer. I think there's no question that it's a warning that we have a, a really a problem with toxic chemicals in many parts of, the, of this country. It's likely that uh, there would be diseases associated with pollutants in other parts of the country, and in fact this is actually being proven to be the case. There are problems with uh, diseases in fish in the Boston Harbor, for example, to include uh, liver tumors. Scientists say that street runoff and industrial discharges flushed through Boston sewage treatment plants are the source of the harbor's toxic contaminants. The results are painfully obvious for commercial fishermen like Bruce Simpson. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of fish, like this flounder here with the red spots on them, and uh, tumors. I don't think you want to take them home and give them to your mother, right? Studies assessing the risk of eating cancerous fish are incomplete. Officials say that most fish on the market are caught offshore in unpolluted areas. But Boston's winter flounder are being sold commercially. Simpson agreed to have his catch checked for tumors because he's concerned that pollution is destroying his fishing grounds. The flounder he caught in Boston's outer harbor were later analyzed by Dr. John Harshbarger from the National Tumor Registry. Nine of 11 fish with visible lesions show changes that normally lead to cancer. Out of a thousand fish livers, this is the worst one I've ever seen. Well, I think uh, polluted areas that, that show problems like this should be closed for uh, commercial fishing. I don't think that uh, unsuspecting people should be uh, served specimens from populations like this. What frightens Dr. Harshbarger is that Boston could be just one out of a hundred bays in America polluted by toxics. Government scientists are studying these 50 sites on America's shores. They suspect many may contain disease fish. More on this environmental problem when we come back. Almost 90% of the nation's offshore oil and gas is produced in the Gulf of Mexico. More than a quarter of the country's fish is caught here. The coast is also crowded with over 90 petrochemical plants, many of which may be discharging toxics directly in the Gulf. Sharing the same seas like unwilling dance partners, fishermen and industry try to preserve an uneasy truce. But fishermen are quick to complain about debris in their nets, including, they say sometimes, barrels of toxic waste. Once it's kicked over the side, it's out of sight. They can fly over as many miles or ride over it and as far as you want in a boat, and it looks beautiful. But we down on the bottom. That's where we hey, work, Joe. on the bottom. Yo! Pick up these chemical barrels. They don't only mess up the shrimp that you've got in that, in that drag. It uh, burns the men's hands, the legs, the faces. It peels the paint on the boat. You've got to get loose from it and get it out of the net and get it back over the boat where it came from before it just kills a bunch of people. You got a pile of shrimp and fish back there and you got that drum and you dump it, it ex gets exposed to the air and it starts smoking like a, a smoke bomb. One, one time, we didn't know what to do, jump overboard or what. You throw all your shrimp away, you can't keep them. We're seeing the potential of the problem at this point. The product is still a good product, and we're trying to keep it a good product. It's a gradual buildup. That is the, the biggest garbage can there is in the world, and it's the easiest to cover up. It's better than land. You have to cover it with dirt on land or something. You get it out of sight. This way, one flip, and the sucker's out of sight. And if the guy's not standing there hanging on to it, who put it there? So there's what you're working with. Some of the discarded drums are labeled like this one marked Mobile. The company declined to be interviewed, but in response to written questions, Mobile spokesmen claim that drums on the company's platforms are marked and stored in gray containers. They said the barrel we found could have come from any of its customers. More damaging to the fishermen are the pipes and debris that rip up their nets. Since 1979, oil companies have paid fishermen almost $2 million in compensation for damaged gear. Uh, just about any 
thing you would see in an oil field is out there on the bottom. The primary thing is the damage to the trawl and the loss in downtime. We not only lose the catch, we tear up the rigging and the equipment. We pick up old pipe. Uh, they're required to bury pipelines. They're not burying pipelines. We had one boat hang pipelines, I think, uh, was $9,000 damage. That gas spewing up. They dump stuff out there that's unbelievable. And good fishing bottom, too. I mean, a uh, fine bottom, nothing wrong with it. And same way with your oil companies on these pipelines. I mean, let's, uh, let's face it. Uh, we're nobody compared to them because we got to have their product. But still and all, they, they're polluting that gulf for us. Oil companies claim that their rigs act as artificial reefs and actually increase the Gulf's fish population. Amid great fanfare last October, Pinnacle Oil dropped this retired production platform off Miami. State officials agreed that the new reef would be a boom to sport fishing. Tenneco's president claims that offshore operations are not the source for any hazardous waste. The regulations uh, aboard platforms of this sort are so absolutely strict that uh, nothing of any deleterious character is ever placed in the sea. And we're extremely sensitive to that sort of thing. And uh, I, I think if you look at it historically, uh, the American industry has done an absolutely incredible job. When we leave a site, we send down divers, and by law, we have to be sure that that bottom is clear. So when the structure is removed, there really is no debris left. Uh, the only time there may be anything they could entangle their nets on is when the structure is there and they can see where it is. And the reason that they're close enough to entangle the nets is that that's where the fish are. CNN hired a team of divers to check the industry's claims. Beneath the waves, the rigs look like underwater aquariums stocked with hundreds of fish. Underwater cameras also recorded a submerged junkyard of discarded wire and pipe and a barrel that oozed out a thick black cloud of debris when we tried to bring it to the surface. Some barrels of waste don't stay hidden in the Gulf. In two years, 500 drums have washed up on the Padre Island National Seashore in Texas. Over 300 contain substances most classified as hazardous. Coast Guard officials said the drums may come from the shipping, oil and gas, or petrochemical industry. Park Superintendent Bill Lukens is alarmed that campers have used the drums as tables and reflectors for fires. People come to a national park expecting to find a safe place. And people don't know or understand the, how dangerous these things can be. One of the materials we know about is quinoline. If you spill a cup of it on you, Dan Island, uh, 50 miles, you may not make it back to the hospital in time. Others say you can put your whole arm in it for four hours, but at the end of four hours, you wouldn't have any arm left. It would be all rotted off. Another one has been, was uh, anthracene. We have anthracene in one of these drums we've collected now. It's a known carcinogen. And uh, if you got it on you, uh, you probably, cancer would almost definitely result. We have visitors out on the beach, uh, visitors in bathing suits, little kids and all. It may be that nothing will happen until people start dying. That's possible from this, sure, sure. Any place along, along the coastline. Uh, the only thing that's saved it so far is dilution. You know, there hadn't been, but, but the numbers are increasing and it's bound to happen. Almost 5,000 hazardous waste sites, or 40% of the nation's total, are located in coastal counties. Officials say most illegal discharges don't come packaged in marked barrels. We'll have more when we return. Without clean estuaries, countless species of ocean life would be threatened with extinction. A case in point, the striped bass of the Chesapeake Bay. These fishermen may be the last of a century's old tradition. Last January, Maryland imposed a complete ban on the commercial catch of striped bass, declaring the fish a threatened species. Everything they catch in these nets will be returned to the bay. To compensate them for the loss of their jobs, the state hired fishermen to study the decline of the fish. Everybody involved in this will 
tell you that pollution is the major cause for the depletion of everything. I mean, they're having trouble with these types of seafood reproducing. The people that are in the position to do something about it have been ignoring it for a long time, trying to th thinking that maybe it would just go away. They can't go and shut down these big industries and these big sewage treatment plants, and they can't force the farmer to, to cut back on his certain types of chemicals and things he puts on the land. It, it would be a political and catastrophe. It was a lot easier for them to get rid of two or three hundred fishermen. I wish there were some other way to do it. Fishing pressure has exceeded the species' capacity to reproduce itself. Acid rain and effects from acid rain have been identified as probably a major source of mortality for very young fish. 400. I don't think I would mind the idea of giving up this profession if, if I knew that I was doing something wrong. But for me to have to give up something that, that's been done around here for hundreds of years, probably, because somebody else is causing a problem, and for me to pay the price for them, I, I, it's really hard for me to accept. What's even harder for these fishermen to accept is that the fish they save may be caught in nearby states without a moratorium. All the states in the Chesapeake have agreed to work in a joint cleanup effort, and $42 million was appropriated by Congress. Most scientists agree this is only a drop in the bucket. Dr. Nick Parker is studying the effects of acid rain on Chesapeake striped bass larvae. If they die out, they're extinct. And if we just continue to uh, pollute our environment and catch the last fish until the last fish is gone, then yes, we could see the striped bass go the way the buffalo went. Maybe we're at the point that uh, we must take some type of action. Maybe we, have to, we should pay that cost now and not pass them to our children and their children, an environment that is so degraded that they will not live in the same kind of world that we were able to grow up in. But that day may have already come for some of New York's fishermen. Last spring, state officials announced that striped bass caught in New York waters contain PCBs, a suspected carcinogen, in levels above new federal guidelines. Fishermen threatened with the closure met in an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. And they want to just wipe us out completely to the point where there's not going to be any inshore fishing in this country at all. There already are rumors going around that they find in PCBs and bluefish and eels. They already did close down up in Massachusetts. Uh, part of the lobster fishery in uh, New Bedford. More people die from cancer from smoking cigarettes, and they can't even find one person who got cancer from PCBs and striped bass. And, and they're going to put a ban on us and knock us out? They do not want to catch fish that's going to hurt anybody. And we don't want to sell them if it's going to hurt anybody. What we want is to show the public that there is nothing wrong with the fish. A week after the meeting, the state banned commercial striped bass fishing in New York Harbor and western Long Island. Mayor Edward Koch issued his own advisory in rebutting local fishermen. Well, what do you expect fishermen to say? It's ridiculous to take a chance with PCBs. Stop eating the striped bass. In fact, the striped bass would prefer that you stopped eating them. For Ralph Pastore, 15 years of fishing came to an abrupt end. CNN obtained a special waiver from the state to test Pastori's catch for PCBs. The chemical compound is no longer dumped in the Hudson, but for fishermen, the damage is already done. I don't understand how toxic chemicals can be dumped in the Hudson River to start with. But GE uh, dumped uh, tons of PCBs in the Hudson. They had actual dump sites. It makes us very angry. Well, there aren't words to describe what, what they've done to this area, what they've done to, these, to this body of fish, and they can't be touched for it today. Meanwhile, the resource continues to be contaminated. The resource continues to be uh, unharvestable, and uh, the fishermen now have been put out, completely out of business by General Electric. A General Electric spokesman claimed the company did not know PCBs were harmful prior to the late 60s. The company paid the state $4 million in an out-of-court settlement of the issue. I'll tell you, you're not a fisherman because, because there's a lot of money in it or because uh, it's a very glamorous thing to do. You're a fisherman because you enjoy it. Let's see if we can catch another one here. Got him this time. Well, if you're fishing commercially, you can catch 100. 
couple of hundred. Well, I've been eating them all my life, and I've never had a problem with them. Nice, clean-looking fish. He doesn't look like he's contaminated, does he? You've got PCBs, have you? If he does, he doesn't know it. <laughs> Tests conducted on these fish by Columbia University scientists detected PCB levels of 3.5 parts per million, well above the new federal guidelines. I've been a commercial fisherman for 15 years, and I really don't know what to do. What does a 33-year-old guy do when he's got uh, no schooling or no other uh, job profession? Right now, I'm laying sheetrock, doing carpentry, sanding floors, whatever I can do to pay my rent. Hopefully, we'll be able to return to the fishing ground someday. Hopefully. State officials said Pastore might have a long wait. They said the PCBs previously dumped will linger and contaminate marine life for decades. The fate of Gloucester, Massachusetts has always depended on its fishermen, and recently their record is nothing short of disastrous. For two years, commercial landings for some of New England's most important species have dropped more than 40%. For these men, those statistics translate into more work for less money, forcing them to go out even in the roughest sea. My father was a fisherman, my grandfather was a fisherman. And I choose to be a fisherman. I don't know if that was my mistake. Lousy, lousy, lousy life. <laughs> oh, like today, it's miserable. It's cold. Right, it's the wind fact, I bet you it's uh, 10, 20 below. It's like this. You don't get no fish. Then you can contend with the weather. See what it is today? Uh, only, only nuts do this. Well, we gotta do it. We got we got bills, we got houses, we got kids. The families, that's all we know. Every year it gets worse, every year, less and less. You see the haddock in there? <laughs> not one haddock that was there on deck, not one. Let's get a lot of haddock around here years ago. But for us today, it didn't pay, it didn't pay for us today. We lost money today. <laughs> if we pay for the fuel, we're lucky. We tore our nets up so we didn't do so well. Sometimes that happens, it's part of the business. That means the boys do a lot of work for nothing. No pay today. <laughs> Mile clear on the starboard side. Watch the starboard side. You're all clear. Plenty of room. Plenty of room. Things are at a crisis, and unless our government and unless industry gets together and start to put their act together, Gloucester would be a ghost town. In the last two years, year and a half, a lot of people in the industry just could not make it. I would hate to see Gloucester be all condominiums and Marblehead Harbor with sailboats. I don't know what else to do. And I keep saying it's going to get better, it's going to get better, and I haven't seen, I see it get worse. I don't believe it. Who's the medium? How many medium? How many medium? Right, Doc. You're getting to be hard, you know what? Some of the fishermen's problems can be traced to previous attempts to help them. Ten years ago, the massive foreign fleets were kicked out of U.S. waters after critics accused them of raping the sea. To help fill the gap, the Farm Credit Administration lent billions to modernize the U.S. fleet. Unfortunately, officials say some of that money improved the ability of fishermen to catch already depleted species, just one factor responsible for bankruptcies adding up to several hundred million dollars. In my opinion, I think we're in certain species. We're definitely overfishing. We've never seen so many fish in such a, a level of decline. When the tuna mile limit went in, we had tremendous growth of some of the fleet through the technology available to us. So we're surpassing the effort capabilities of the foreign fleet when they were fishing out here back in the 60s and 70s. But the foreign fleets are not all gone. 80 miles off the coast of Cape May, New Jersey, a team of East German factory boats awaits the arrival of this American fisherman, Lars Axelson. Together, they will look for the still plentiful schools of mackerel. Critics of the joint venture say foreign factory boats, especially Soviet block trawlers, should not be allowed off the U.S. coast. Axelson sees them as good customers who saved him from financial ruin by buying species of fish without a market in America. Yeah, I guess we steam for the, the big boats, I guess, huh? Nothing else to do. Well, we're on our way. 80 miles to go. Right now is making a real good living for me. 
That's why I like joint venture, because in essence, it allows the American to do the catching and the foreigner to do the processing, you know? Night was approaching by the time Axelson reached the German fleet. The factory boats need massive hauls of fish to keep their floating assembly line busy. The only way the Americans can do that is by pair trawling, a dangerous operation involving the towing of one net in between two rocking boats. The men are tense as they tie up their boats on high seas. No one relaxes until the Germans snag up the net and drag it up to their processor. The trip wouldn't be profitable for the East Germans if they depended only on the Americans. They catch most of their fish directly. This massive haul was their biggest in over 100 days of fishing. Critics say this opens a big loophole in the nation's 200-mile limit. But officials like Phil Coates are more concerned that some of the financially pressed American fishermen may become too dependent on working with the foreigners. We're focusing all our fishing effort on a limited number of species. What we've got to do is diversify, because we've got a tremendous abundance of mackerel out there right now. All of it's going virtually to, to what limited foreign fishing remains and to these so-called joint ventures. So there's tremendous concern right now about what's going on. If we don't turn this around, we, we face a very dismal future. Gloucester's fishermen know the present is dismal enough. They're losing their market to what they say is a heavily subsidized Canadian industry, and they claim they can't cover their escalating business expenses. Some say a few are abandoning fishing by intentionally sinking their boats and cashing in on insurance policies. Since 1980, 40 boats have failed to make it back to the Gloucester dock. The Gloucester Daily Times noted that most went down in calm seas and that crewmen on the lost boats were often related. This is very dangerous. It means somebody can die. Vito Ferrara, a focus of newspaper reports and owner of two boats that sunk, claims these pictures prove he's innocent. He says his brother, Giochino Ferrara, the captain in both sinkings, had to be dragged by force off the boat he was trying to save. After the second sinking, Giochino Ferrara went back to Sicily, and Vito Ferrara paid off his mortgage with a million dollar insurance payment. My reputation is important because um, um, I have three kids, and uh, and I like it. My family have a clear names. I don't like those people talking and those kind of things about me. The FBI confirmed that it is investigating the sinking of Vito Ferrar's boat, the Giacomo F, valued at one and a half million dollars. No one on the Gloucester waterfront wants to point an accusing finger at their neighbors, but Frederick Lieber told CNN that when he put his boat on the market, a lot of people asked why he didn't just sink it. We were all having difficult times, uh, and uh, some suggestions were made on the waterfront here that, that um, I sink the boat intentionally in order to recover the insurance. And why didn't you choose to do that? I suppose I'm, it just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Now, good after hockey, you have phone call 05, good after hockey, phone call 05. Coast Guard officers said a few captains seemed to delay their rescue efforts by giving incorrect positions in their radio distress calls. The guys that are, uh, you know, sinking their boats on purpose, we'd rather not get a call from them. Our own people are putting their lives at stake for somebody that's committing a crime. Unfortunately, the legitimate fishermen who aren't doing any wrong, who do have a, a legitimate problem on their boat where they have to get an insurance settlement, they in turn are now paying all the exorbitant premiums for boat insurance, if they can find it. Financial pressure isn't the only thing sinking fishermen. According to a Coast Guard report, fishermen are increasingly venturing out in rough weather as they try to cope with stiffer competition for scarce resources and more restrictive conservation laws. Every year, over 250 fishing boats and an average of 80 fishermen are lost at sea a fatality rate that is seven times the American industry norm. These men survived a stormy night on the Atlantic when their boat sank in 10-foot seas. Two others weren't as lucky. Because surf clams are scarce, at the time of the sinking, the men were allowed to fish only one day a week, selected a month in advance. They say they can't afford to miss working on their designated day, even during rough weather. Vivid memories like these are also no deterrent. All the survivors went back to fishing.
This is a Florida patch reef, an underwater habitat for hundreds of marine species. Some of these reefs may have a limited lifespan. They're located near an offshore dump site and may be smothered by silt dredged from Tampa's port. Every year, almost 53 million cubic yards of material is dumped off America's coast. The sea floor of industrial ports is often laced with toxic chemicals, and some scientists say it should not be disposed in the ocean. Harbor officials counter that our ports could not survive without ocean dumping. If society wants to continue to depend on water transport, particularly deep water transport for its commodities, the only alternative that's going to be left is ocean dumping. You cover up coral and the fish's habitat with a bunch of sludge and, and contaminated dirt and everything else what they're putting out there. It's uh, nothing's going to grow in that stuff. The fish catch over a period of time, you're probably down 80 percent from what it used to be. You ought to put it in their backyard. The people that are getting this all done, the big shipping people, let them dump it on their property, see what they can grow with it. I got a crop out there just like a farmer has. And you mess up my, my farmland and I ain't gonna like it. Well, right now the resources are hurt because we're, we're disturbing that area, but this rise in the bottom will attract uh, marine life and, and growth and fish, so in the future, fishing will be very, very good in that area. The top layer we're digging, maybe the top foot might, might have some contaminated material, but you know, we're digging 15 feet below that. You know, we're not equipped to find any, uh, to look for any metals or do any tests like that. And that's exactly what worries scientists from the Moat Marine Laboratory, who along with a school of dolphins, escorted CNN to the dump site. Our primary objection is that nobody really knows what the long-term effects are. There's believed to be high concentrations of some toxic materials in these sediments, and they don't have any idea whether or not it works its way into our food chain, or if it just settles out into the sediments and stays put. To get a close-up look at a fresh dump site, Underwater cameraman Richard Stewart dove right under the barge as it made its final pass. If there's a risk, then it's a risk we'll take because it's kind of things that we need to show people. We're seeing a lot of dumping all over the country. It's something that's not working for us, for our society, and, it's, and since we depend on the oceans, and this is destroying the, the, uh, the continued existence of it, it's something that we need to do. So we'll dive in any kind of muck if, it, if it's going to prove a point. Wherever it sits, it smothers. There's no way that any animal down there could uh, survive that. They'll move on if they can. Seconds later, a turtle broke the surface, escaping the thick cloud of debris. It is this kind of habitat destruction that disturbs moat marine biologist James Coulter. He says the EPA may have erred initially by selecting dump sites in the vicinity of healthy patch reefs. This area is probably a mistake because there was too much live bottom. They just messed up when they came here, I suppose. You won't get a hard bottom community coming back. You won't get corals growing there. So there's a lot of fish that tend to hang around hard bottom habitats. One small area like this is a dump may not really hurt all that much, but then, you know, all over the coast of the U.S., things like this are happening. You know, these are things that are going to come back to us in the long run um, by reducing the amount of fish or, um, you know, how productive an area is. It's, you know, people have to realize we're not isolated from our environment. We're part of it, just like those animals are. And uh, if we keep dumping on them, eventually it's going to come around and be dumped on us. I mean, it's going to come full circle. Key West, Florida, famous for its vibrant nightlife and breathtaking beaches. But there's another side of this resort town that the casual tourists will never see. Below these shimmering waters, and less than a mile offshore, the city is discharging raw sewage in close proximity to coral reefs. Divers and environmentalists from Survival of the Sea volunteer to give us a close look at the plume. If we can go up, say, 100 feet you or can so. Follow the pipe. Yeah, we you can follow the pipe. Yeah, we can follow the pipe, yeah. You can, you can uh, see that a mile away. There's an awful smelling around here. These people out here are fishing right in the middle of it. The diseases that the fish uh, can transmit by living in the bacteria is, are different things like uh, hepatitis and uh, typhoid and cholera. And there have been numerous cholera outbreaks in uh, Texas and Louisiana just the last few months from eating shellfish and fish and waters contaminated like this. 
These are the coral reefs Key West is famous for, an underwater mosaic of color and life. But near the point of discharge, everything both living and dead is bleached a sickly greenish hue. You see that stuff coming out, you know, everything around is dead and coated. Corals are all dead, just like the Dead Sea. God, it's disgusting. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that just really shouldn't be happening at all. I hope somebody will see this and decide this is a bunch of crap, literally, <laughs> and end it. I have warning buoys here. Don't fish, don't swim, don't sail across it. You don't see anything. And I think that city ought to react to this a lot quicker than they have. This has been going on for 30 years or more. For 10 of those years, Charles McCoy was mayor. McCoy claims it's natural to discharge sewage in the ocean. Philosophically, I can say that uh, uh, the ocean, to a certain extent, uh, this is a normal thing for it for these things to go on. There are fish and whales that are doing this all day long. And of course, they're not disturbing the environment, but they're actually contributing to it. But again, that's, uh, that's on another level. Uh, the, the law was a law, and we were going to abide by it. McCoy claims he wanted to build a sewage treatment plant for $60 million that would discharge reusable water. Critics say McCoy submitted the most expensive plan possible in the hope that it wouldn't be built. Well, I think some of the motivations may have been that uh, if you got an extremely expensive plan, ultimately you couldn't execute it. All they were doing was licensing continued noncompliance. Mm -hmm. And the EPA should have been looking after that. State officials are pressuring the city to comply with existing federal and state regulations prohibiting raw sewage outfalls. Environmental officers escorted us to the site and sampled the water for fecal contaminants. They noted that the mayor is pushing for the construction of a sewage treatment plant. But for the next three years, the city will continue to pump out two and a half tons of suspended solids a day. The water sample taken at the outfall violated the state standard for fecal coliform by over 40 times, a gross violation with a maximum penalty of $10,000 a day. If the plant is not operational in three years, the city of Key West will be back in court. Every day this source is in existence, you know, bothers me. Uh, when you consider the wa waterborne diseases associated with uh, uh, human waste. On a, a strong wind generated current, it could feasibly move into this area, closer to the shoreline and the beaches. I think it's very typical of what's happening to the ocean everywhere. We've drug our nets off New York and pick them up and have to drag nets behind the boat for 30 minutes to wash the stench out. You pick up your nets and you, you know, there's junk and garbage and barrels of toxic waste and stuff that's not supposed to be out there. We're the eyes of the world when it comes to what's happening on the bottom. All across the country, millions of productive acres are closed to shell fishing because of pollution. This map shows those areas on the East Coast. In New York, over 2,000 people have become ill in the last four years from eating raw clams, prompting threats from the state to ban raw shellfish in restaurants. Pollution, improper handling, and poachers who clam in closed waters are all responsible. Captain Richard Otterstead is out on a cold, wet night to find any lawbreakers. Well, a uh, person coming out here at night illegally clamming he can make well into, uh, you know, well over $1,000, $2,000 uh, per night. If we find a person shell fishing at night, he will lose his boat and he will be placed under arrest. What the police failed to find that night, on another occasion, CNN did. These men are harvesting shellfish in illegal waters. They only agree to be filmed if we conceal their identity. Nah, we don't want to break the law, but this is the only way to go. Now that they keep closing all the areas, they're choking us. They're going to choke us to the point where the American payment's going to die out. Next thing you know, he's on the welfare line. Even though I'm breaking the law, I do have my own personal standards. 
If I can't eat it, I'm not going to sell it to somebody to eat. But tainted clams are not the Long Island clam industry's only problem. Over-harvesting has drastically shrunk in the take of what was once the nation's leading producer. Last winter, hundreds of northern clammers headed south to this quiet river in central Florida. They discovered it was lined solid with clams. For locals like Roy Hunt, an easygoing lifestyle changed overnight. The Indian River clam rush was on. In the past, you could clam on the river and go on for maybe a mile before you seen another boat. But now, no matter who, just about anywhere you clam on the river, you, you've got people all over you. There's people right on top of you. It's a, really a clamming boom going on now. The opportunity is here. Come out on the river and you're going to start making $100 to $300 a day. Many locals weren't interested in sharing the good times with newcomers from the north, especially if it led to another barren estuary. We just keep hammering and hammering and hammering on a fishery until it's gone. We've got a beautiful natural estuary, Mother Nature's own cradle, and I can't see destroying it. We go back to the Chesapeake, to the Great South Bay, uh, to what they've done in Massachusetts and what they've done in Rhode Island. And we're in the process of doing the same thing. Some Southerners weren't happy just complaining. About a dozen boats were sunk mysteriously, and tempers were hot on the water. I feel that they're coming down and they're taking my living away from me. Most of them the northerners, they're only here for the gravy. When it gets thin, they're going to move away. And then they'll look for another hot spot. I'm one of your more moderate southerners. I, I'm not out, out to shoot them yet. I hate to see it. I really do. I haven't advocated violence ever. And I don't advocate it now. The only reason, I, as I say, I would carry a gun is if things got hot enough where I'd have to worry about my own safety. It's not to start anything. Northern Baymen say the locos are missing the point of the problem. Charlie Hotkeveg claims the pollution he fled from up north is just one step behind him. After heavy rains, even the booming Indian River was temporarily closed because of pollution except for one jam-packed section dubbed Starvation Cove. There was a lot of talk about the northerners coming down here, and this is a prime example. We've been forced down here because of pollution. We have to get up and say something or do something, or we, we, there's just not going to be anything left. I expressed that in Long Island 15 years ago, and everybody laughed at me. And then we went to Rhode Island, and they laughed there. And now we're in Florida, and I don't think they're laughing anymore. Most of us northerners that moved down here have been up and down the East Coast for the last 15 years. And I mean, Florida is the end of the road. Florida is not a forgotten hideaway. In fact, it's one of the fastest growing states in the country. 6,000 newcomers move here every week, and most want to live on the coastline. These state scientists are studying the resulting loss of marine habitat and the corresponding drop in the fish. 80% of the previously existing seagrass in the bay has disappeared. There has been a corresponding very dramatic drop off in the fisheries catch. In many developed areas like these, the seagrasses are now gone. This is the typical bottom type in this kind of area. Uh, now you could typify it as a desert. Certainly, if we can destroy a bay uh, of the size of Tampa Bay, we have the potential to go out and turn the oceans into a Tampa Bay. This type of of development is no longer allowed. However, it seems before the problems will be solved, it's going to be too late. And I think the future looks pretty grim for Florida's fishermen. With less fish to go around, a fight is inevitable between the state's commercial and recreational fishermen. Some guy's sitting down there with a $100,000 yacht, and you're sitting there with a $2,000 a uh, fishing boat, you, you know you ain't got a prayer. They don't like us fishing here. They feel like we're the reason there isn't any more fish, and they don't realize that they're living on the reason there isn't any more fish. I've had them throw rocks, shake a hammer. One, I've been uh, shot over my head with a gun. They shoot right over your head. Uh, I've had them jump in their boats and run out and run through your net and cut your nets in two. Just go completely crazy. So that's some of the things we have to contend with now as the development goes along. 
Many residents of Florida's new waterfront homes claim they're the ones being harassed. Ernest Marshall drafted a controversial local law keeping commercial fishermen away from man-made canals and the developed shoreline. Here's a good example. Here's your commercial fisherman right here, coming down here. Just recently, I had an incident happen to me here. Commercial fishermen were fishing in broad daylight right out here in the canal, contrary to the law of fishing. So I went and took these pictures. And as I was taking the pictures, one of the fishermen said that if you want to take a picture of something, here, take a picture of this. And with that, he turned around and dropped his pants and waved his rear end at me. And I said, sure. And I took his picture. And I have the pictures here. There's a picture of him with his rear end sticking out there at me. Yes, there's going to be violence. And yes, somebody's going to get hurt. Now, in my own home, I, ke I keep at least two high-powered rifles, a shotgun, and two or three handguns. I'm not going to subject myself or my wife or my kids to threats and intimidation from the commercial fishermen or anybody. We'll have more when we return. Every spring, the music echoes in Louisiana's bayous. Another shrimp season opens with a Cajun-style blessing of the fleet. But these are not happy days for the Gulf shrimp industry, which some officials say is functionally bankrupt. They say the future looks dim because Louisiana is losing its shrimp nursery. 50 square miles of coastal marshes disappear every year. At that rate, all of Rhode Island would be gone in two decades. Scientists say most of the damage is man-made. Studies show that canals dug for oil exploration and shipping allow seawater to invade and destroy the Gulf's delicate marshes. Eugene Turner from the Center for Wetlands Research demonstrates the erosion of one parish by superimposing an aerial map from 1945 with one 40 years later. In 20 years, we will have lost one-fifth of our fisheries potential. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. How do you calculate things like that? You can't. These are the renewable resources as long as we have them. It's disturbing because the basis of support for that renewable resource is the wetlands, and they're eroding. Wetlands are not the only thing vanishing. The oil wells all across Louisiana are starting to run dry. Texaco, one of the largest operators in the state, canceled a scheduled interview, but we did talk to one small wildcat operator. We want to preserve our environment. Uh, I like clean air and clean water as much as, uh, as uh, some clown living in, in New York or Miami uh, would like to see it. So, but uh, you have to temper that, I guess, a little bit with the realities of life. We, we drill for oil and gas, and we can't handle it like it's our page. We sell it by the barrel, not by the ounce. Hard to make an omelet without breaking an egg. So, And I, I suppose we, we break some eggs and, and have to pay for it or compensate someone for it. This is part of our Cajun culture. We're trying to hold it. I think it's the best life there is. Do you ever see a Cajun with a sad face? <laughs> look, look, seriously, look. Some Cajuns say they have little reason to celebrate claiming that much of their marsh and farmlands are hopelessly polluted. The state is riddled with over 20,000 oil fill waste pits and nearly 5,000 injection wells, some containing hazardous waste. For legal purposes under the state environmental programs and laws, uh, all fill waste is regulated or classified as non-hazardous waste, when in fact it's uh, all field waste is just as hazardous as many industrial waste. These farmers are especially concerned since they live right next to an abandoned waste pit. A state health department study detected heavy metals in their water. Some of them continue to drink from their wells. They say they can't afford to buy it in bottles. They told me to not drink the water when we went to Baton Rouge. <coughs> on a hot day, you could stand there on the level and you could see them that bubbling, it was bubbling all, all, around, all, all around. We all have grandchildren around here. Everybody has. And we're going to leave this land that we own. We're going to leave that to our grandchildren. And if this land is all poisoned and it can't be used, what will our, our children and grandchildren have to look forward to? This drains into one of the main streams that go all the way to the Mermintor River and on down the line. 
people are catching fish in the streams and, and, and they're pumping their water from the, the, the main drainage system into the crawfish ponds. Now, what will it do to the fish industry? We, we're not sure, but we're concerned. To find out if contaminants were leaking from the pit and into adjacent commercial crawfish ponds, CNN hired a lab to test for heavy metals associated with drilling muds. The crawfish in the crawfish pond contained chromium at 7.8 parts per million and zinc at 14 parts per million. The level is elevated. Officials from Louisiana's seafood sanitation program said these chromium levels were eight times higher than anything they'd seen. FDA scientists said the toxic forms of chromium normally break down to harmless substances. But other toxicologists cautioned that with such high levels detected, tests should be done on a complete list of possible contaminants. In another site, a crawfish pond shared a levee with a waste pit. I keep my pits checked for heavy metals and things of that uh, sort. I think we're doing a service for the whole community. Following this interview, Waggis Pack Disposal was closed temporarily and forced to upgrade the facility. The company was also fined $11,000 for accepting unauthorized material. Many health professionals in Louisiana are concerned that waste materials disposed carelessly may be triggering a cancer epidemic in the state. I don't think you can rely on, on talking to these people because they're all doing it for one reason, money. We've seen cases right here, right under our, our noses, where maybe two or three members in the family die in a very short time, all with cancer. We see so many of them. I go down the road and I, I can see the houses, the widows, where the husbands died with cancer. It just frightens me when I think that way. I hate to tell you this, but when you talk to me about the state regulation and this and that, Politics is so bad around here, I, I don't have any faith at all. When you say politics to me, you killed a horse right there. I don't have any confidence. Governor Edwin Edwards. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. I just happened to have a day off from the grand jury, so I thought I'd come down here and meet with you on a joyous occasion. I'm very pleased to be here today to join with you in dedicating Governor this Edwin Edwards is now on trial in New Orleans for racketeering and fraud. Critics have accused him of giving favorable treatment to the oil industry in Louisiana. He came to the bayous of La Rose to christen the Pelican, a state-funded marine research vessel. I just think that there's an over sensationalism about the oil and gas industry destroying marshlands. It is the same thing that you hear a lot of people talk about, the fact that some parts of Louisiana has a high cancer rate. But we are you know, the kind of people in, who are Cajuns who love to eat and have a good time. And who knows, maybe our own lifestyles are contributing to some of the health problems we have. The people in Louisiana are not complaining about it, and people who are enjoying the benefits of the cheap oil and gas produced here should not complain themselves. But in the bayous, and now threatened marshes of Louisiana, many Cajuns accustomed to living off the Delta's bounty say they're unhappy with the destruction of their ancestral home. Yeah, these are beautiful oysters, huh? If you can call an oyster beautiful, that is. I don't know, I, li I like the looks of them myself. Now watch, you see these? You go when the water's clear, and that's what, that's the beautiful part of it. You reach down in there and bring a, bring a, a cluster of oysters this size. Watch, I'll show you something. Boy, isn't that beautiful? Look. Swallowed him alive, by God. Mmm. This is living, man. This is living. Hmm? Things that really matter in this, in this country are not being taken care of. Right here. The water I've seen in another 10 years, it'll be gone. And that's not a long time. People do not care. I see it and I'm, 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 I'm more filled with a sense of sadness than anything else because it'll be gone forever. Real Cajuns are fast disappearing. You, you uh, got a taste of the good life and uh, if you can call it a good life, prosperity and big automobiles and don't get wet and muddy if you don't have to. 
When it all runs out, there will be absolutely nothing. Just like I always say, a big fat nothing. And uh, you can always say, well, I'm not going to live so long that it'll bother me, you know? But what happens to the next generation? I could spend days walking these beaches. <laughs>